Oh, what a hideous face, even as it gargled on the thick, viscous blood oozing from its own smashed brain. Does such a creature even consider its brain an integral part of its composition? Or so the Fairweather Knight thought to himself as he triumphantly gazed down upon the little green mongrel. Goblins, while they seem to exhibit a shred of self-awareness, rarely do they appear to utilize such. This one here, the Fairweather Knight found eating the innards of its own dead compatriot. A sin of the highest magnitude where the civilized reside. Not as though one could expect the barbaric goblins possible of civility or any of the like, the knight reassured himself. And so, upon finding the unaware creature, the knight had taken swift action and seized the heroic moment presenting itself to him. Brandishing his longsword in both hands, the knight brought his sword crashing onto the goblin in a single focused and unwieldy arc. The creature's head collapsed upon the crushing impact and the sound of a crunch as its skull resisted only slightly before the cleaving steel broke in. The tension of steel and bone ground against one another, until, ultimately, the creature's head gave way and the sword split the head like an opened pumpkin. The long sword dug deeper than intended and became caught by the goblin's mass of tendons, flesh, and muscle. Now looking down at the goblin, the size of the beast gave the knight pause as it dangled upon his blade, twitching erratically. With skin green like vile poison, it had been small in stature, inhabiting a body closest resembling a human boy of twelve or so. A strike drew from such a valiant master of the blade. So spoke a deep, unfamiliar voice in the distance. The ambushing voice caught the victory tranced knight by surprise, a voice that seemed to come from the direction of an old rotting orchard off the road near to where he stood. A plopping sound fell below the night. Gunk and disgust began collapsing upon the dirt path as the leaky goblin's head split further, being pulled down from its own lifeless weight. Paying no mind to the grotesque occurrence, the Fairweather Knight shifted his head in all directions, hoping to spot the source of the voice. Hindered by a narrowed eye slit, due to the thick steel helm he wore, he could spot none in the orchard. Once again, the mysterious voice spoke out. Ah, yes. It is not often your kind speak with others of this land. You've seen me, brave champion, as you strut your gaze, but perhaps you did not expect that which you've perceived. The distant voice trailed off and remained quiet for a moment, allowing the knight to continue his investigation. The knight tightened his impeded vision, while armor made of the highest skilled blacksmiths allowed for an impenetrable defense in battle, it, unfortunately, remained quite lacking in more menial tasks. The Fairweather Knight, still unaware, spoke broadly into the surrounding vicinity. Humblest apologies, friend. I cannot seem to make the origin of your voice. Would it be selfish to ask that you make yourself properly seen, so that I might respectfully make your acquaintance? The heavy, grumbling, and slow-moving voice reached out once again. That which I could. However, I find myself to be indeed quite rooted at the moment. The unfamiliar voice proclaimed as it let out a soft but rumbling, hearty laugh. Rightfully confused, but picking up on what the knight felt was the breadcrumbs of a hint, looked towards a lone oak within the orchard. The knight attempted to maneuver his head back and forth, hoping to uncover the mysterious speaker, perhaps hiding behind the tree. Now using a tone laced with impatience, the knight said, I implore you once again, my peering onlooker, might you reveal yourself? And speak to me, face to face. Where I am from, honorable men avoid speaking from the shadows. While waiting for the mysterious voice to rebut, the knight realized he had been engaging this entire time with the dead goblin's lifeless body, still yet hanging from his longsword. Embarrassment swelled within the knight, and he could feel the hot blood in his face pulsate under his thick helm. He gently shook his blade, hoping to loosen the goblin with ease, to no avail as his strike had sunk so deep that the sword was now crudely embedded within the creature. The knight lifted his heavy sabaton and applied pressure to the goblin's head. A rigid and uncomfortable sound of its fractured skull scraped across the knight's blade before the beast's body released and crumpled onto the ground. Oh, quite an unpleasant sight indeed, the mysterious voice proclaimed. 
and yet one that does not go without need. The knight returned. Is that so? The distant speaker questioned. It seems ignorance has befallen one that has stood here for so long tending to this now poor orchard. I seem to not know of the world my dry roots inhabit. So much so that I'd beg the forgiveness of the honorable knight who has unwittingly come to visit my small, decaying world. The Fairweather Knight set his sights directly upon the old oak itself, and with visible perplexed relief said, Ah, I see you. He then wiped his sword clean before resheathing the blade to rest upon his hip. I have heard tales of the tree folk, yet only thought them to be simply that, fairy tales told to stubborn children refusing to go to sleep. Fairy tales? The oak recited with subtle inquisitiveness, before its voice trailed off into a fading grumble. I know not the word. Alas, the fairies have all left, Knight. The oak said, as its tone shifted with sadness in its deep, earthen voice. After taking a few moments to itself, the great oak's voice once again returned to the conversation, with a lightened and hearty pitch. Perhaps the young knight would stand before me in my orchard. You've entered my domain, the toll I'd ask you to pay is time. I promise to not allow my greed to overstay your humble welcome. The knight turned towards the path that which he was traveling and, until now, was making good time before the skirmish with the goblin. He was warned these old roads would only grow more threatening during nightfall. However, upon deftly handling the weak goblin with such ease, the fairweather knight felt he was more than prepared for anything this road might throw at him. Of course, the Fairweather Knight warmly proclaimed. As he came off the rocky dirt path and stepped onto the orchard's grounds, he first took notice of the silence that inundated the surrounding air. One might expect a chorus of birds, a grist of buzzing bees, and more than anything, the scent of sweet apples of such a place. Alas, this orchard was indeed dead and none would deny the evident claim. However, the grounds exuded an aura transcending even that of death. In every direction he might peer, the knight could feel a morose ambience that lingered within the stagnant orchard's air. The knight's sabatong sunk into the malleable ground as he shifted his weight to walk. Watery mud seeped up from the shallow impression forming around the knight's boot. He looked at the sucking mud and watched a slick, inky hue of chestnut bleed within and darken the small puddle. This queer and unnatural occurrence confused the Fairweather Knight. It is exactly what you're thinking it might be, the oak said, interrupting the knight's focus. The blood of your people has become the curse fertilizer for this land and my orchard. I can taste it, always. Truly, I... I had heard the stories, but... Never was I aware of the war's effects had on our precious farmlands. It is a sorry sight to behold. The Fairweather Knight said while freeing his sabaton and continuing the next few paces towards the oak. Standing in front of the great oak allowed the knight to look upon the tree creature in greater detail. There was the visage of a face in the form of bending grooves and deep wooden divots upon the lower center of the tree's body. The oak bore a face which appeared humanoid, but certainly not modeled to, in fact, appear human. The oak wore only a single, slanted, broad brow that had been resting over two sunken eyes. The knight could not decipher if there had been eyeballs at the end of the never-ending black holes. In place of a nose had been flat bark that stretched down to an unsymmetrical and very undefined mouth. Looking even further around the oak, its body seemed as if rot had fully set in. The tree, a sad and dull shade of gray, bore multiple bulbous growths, which many had split open. Within the split growths grew black, fuzzy mold that creeped out onto the decaying, barked exterior. Hundreds of crookedly thin branches stretched into the sky, mostly barren of any leaves and somewhat resembling wooden strands of hair. The very few dangling leaves still yet clinging to the oak vibrated from each breath of wind, hoping to dislodge the expired foliage. A sad and sorry state to behold, knight, the oak said sullenly, 
alongside the low-pitched creaking and crackling moans of its wooden body. The Fairweather Knight, taken aback after he realized he had been intrusively gawking, responded, Great Oak, I, I do not wish to offend. Please, forgive my childish staring. The Oak retorted immediately, No offense is taken. I am quite aware of my jarring appearance. I am nearing the end of my time here, an ending I would much like to come with greater haste. The knight found himself speechless at this moment. He tightened the straps on his bracers, hoping that the display of maintenance would serve as a respite, allowing him to gather his next words. While doing so, he looked beyond the oak into the distance. As far as his eyes could see, this orchard had likely been this way for many years. Rotten fruit scattered across the grounds, some still intact, but most remained dried out husks. Others, piles of deformed, melted fruit, fused together like frozen gelatinous blobs. The other trees seemed to have perished long ago, as many appeared to have either fallen or stood like dehydrated sticks, blackened from the inside out by the same creeping mold the knight saw growing upon the oak. Are there truly no others within the orchard? The knight finally said, There is nothing. Not even the buzzing flies visit this dying oak you see before you. No. My visitors today are the cannibalistic goblins and their metallic slayers, Sir Knight. Say, the oak paused before continuing on. Say, I had once heard a rumor long ago from a robin who once nested within my branches. Perhaps idle talk, but I would like to pass this rumor on to you. Please, the knight responded with a welcoming gesture. The great oak took a breath in, as though gathering energy for a long-winded speech, but became quickly overcome by a fit of sudden coughing. Dislodging chunks of wet, fuzzy black mold covered in a layer of sap splashed onto the knight's sabatons. The knight pretended to take no notice wishing no further embarrassment of the poor oak, who was clearly wrought with sickness. Finally, after the coughing had subsided, the oak regained vocal clarity and continued. The gossiping robin. The oak paused yet again and forced one more final cough from within. The black mold loosed once more, but this time unable to fully free itself of the oak as it remained hanging from the corner of the tree's mouth, gently fluttering with every wheeze. The Fairweather Knight, not only battle disciplined, but also adept at conversing with common folk who are often riddled with sickness themselves, humbly regarded the oak with the same demeanor and remained patient as to allow the oak comfort to speak once again. The fuzzy black mold dangled like cave moss from the oak, and he finally returned to speak. The gossiping robin nested among my branches. In a time, I was proud to give lodgings to any and all who wished for such. She had often chirped all manners of things she had witnessed while soaring the skies. Truth be told, her chirps never held interest to an oak who, at the time, only wished for a warm sun and fresh rainwater. Alas, I found her whimsical chirping quite pleasant, and listened as she gossiped where to find the tastiest worms, which high perch allowed the finest dawn and other things robins might find exciting. As a gap filled the conversation, the knight took the moment to join the dialogue. I had not known birds could present such keen observations. I'd surely wish to tame one as a hunting partner some day. I'd imagine the game we'd claim would bring even the king to delight. Game? The oak questioned with a voice of discern, then quickly moved on. The robin had once chirped something of interest. She proclaimed the goblins of these lands took part in many strange customs. When one of their tribesmen had fallen, it was of the highest honor that the one bearing the closest bond would take part in a cannibalistic ceremony. You see, they believed by consuming the blood and organs of their dead, one could inherit not only the power, but the will of their fallen to carry on in their stead. The oak who watched the knight absorb the words he spoke for only a moment before rebutting his own tale with a tone of jovial skepticism. A farce, I said to the robin. Goblins are no more than barbaric, little mongrels who would eat their own mothers for breakfast had the opportunity presented itself. The Fairweather Knight nodded in agreement, perked his chest and said, It is as you say. 
for this had been my first experience with the savages. It was my honor to expunge its foul life from our world. The knight looked upon the horizon and found a darkening sky. Alas, Great Oak, I believe it is time I must take my leave. Evening greets earlier and earlier each day, and I'd not wish to camp out in these vile lands. As the end of the sentence left the knight's mouth, he felt his words might be seen as an insult and quickly sought to correct their intention. Verbally stumbling, the knight found himself unable to mend the sentence quickly enough before the yoke interjected. Vile they are indeed. A deep frown formed upon the old oak's wooden mouth. Though not always was it true, this orchard was where I had been standing sentinel from the very beginning. My roots traversed through these grounds, where I had met the saplings of trees who would grow to be my siblings for many years, of the then tranquil orchard. Today, only their gnarled and withered remains cling wrapped around my blackened roots, serving as constant, sullen reminders. The knight responded, wishing to sympathize with the oak. I'm sorry for your loss, great oak. It saddens me as well. The oak forcefully cut off the knight's words. It is not your sympathy that I require. The deep, bellowing voice of the oak startled the knight as he took a step back to rebalance his weight. It is your honor, knight, the oak said with a now relaxed tone. At this moment, the fairweather knight felt eclipsed by the daunting oak in front of him. Feeling confused and rather diminutive, he struggled to return to the conversation. The oak remained silent. His expressions marked no change. Finally, the knight, with a slight stumble, questioned the oak. Mm, my honor? The great oak's demeanor broke now into a softer state. Yes, I would call on you to answer the request of this decrepit elder tree. You see, as I have already explained in some detail, this orchard has become a place I no longer recognize. A time ago, I watched each of my friends become riddled with the black death that is now slowly eating away at me. I need not imagine a fate I had witnessed many times already. Slow fits of madness, the hollowing of my body, as I inevitably cough up my insides, until, finally, the creeping black will shroud me like a thick, suffocating layer of moss. The fuzzy black mold all too well made the point, fluttering with each wind-felt word as it still clung to the oak's mouth. The fair-weather knight stood motionless until the oak finished speaking, and once silence had filled the air again, he replied, I... I hear your plea, great oak. This is a dark fate that stands before you. However, I... How is it I might be of service to you? Without delay, the oak replied, Help me put an end to this. Allow me to die as I am. But I couldn't. The knight stopped himself, heeding the previous angered statement of the oak. I... I... Once again his mouth stumbled for the second time, and now feeling sheepish as he searched for what he had hoped would be an adequate answer. Fear not, I will guide you, honorable knight. You will not be required to down my very being. There is a simpler way to end the lives of us tree folk. One only needs to know where to cut. The knight unsheathed his long sword and looked down to focus his gaze on its steel blade. Cloudy streaks of the goblin's insides still stained the sword. However, between the faint red and brown blemish, the knight also found his muddled reflection. The sight of his steel-fluted helm reinvigorated the knight's resolve for the image staring back at him was indeed a knight of the crown, a knight who has sworn the royal oath, a decree which requires those chosen to protect the realm and deliver justice, especially in the darkest corners of the land. With his sense of honor rushing back through his veins, he clutched his sword with a mighty grip and, with fiery vigor, said, Great Oak, forgive my moment of weakness. If this is truly what you wish, then... By the royal oath, I will aid you. Then let me waste no more of your time, the oak replied with a sense of finality in its voice. Suddenly, from no more than five paces of the night, a damp rumbling trembled from under the ground. The mud began to separate, revealing a pale green bulb as it rose from the opened earth. 
thin tendrils of root wrapping around the bulb snapped one after the other as the tension of the rising bulb pulled away from where it had been lying under the surface. Strike true, good knight. Doing so will free me from the shackles of this cursed orchard I no longer wish to call my home. The knight would waste not a minute and follow the direction of the oak. Allowing the great creature the utmost respect, he would proudly be the tool for such a being in strife, wishing for the end. The large bull before him pulsated as though an exposed heart might from an open chest. A swirling green liquid sloshed about behind the thin membrane of the risen bulb. Posturing himself into a battle stance, the knight prepared for one swift blow that would crush the bull before him and free the great oak. His muscles, hidden beneath bulky sheets of finely crafted metal, flexed in complete preparation. Twice today would he perform this attack. However, this strike would be brought down in reverence towards the great old oak. Such pride swole within the knight. He would take this tale of the great oak back home and share its tragic story with his kinsmen. Oh, how they would balk at this noble deed called upon him. With one last glance, the fairweather knight shifted his head towards the oak, who let out a beseeching grumble, urging the knight to continue. The orchard stood still at that moment, no gust of putrid wind to bring the foul odor of death across the ragged grounds. Even the creeping rot seemed to give momentary reprieve. The longsword fell, swooping down upon the bulb like a bolt of steel lightning. Upon impact, the bulb burst, and the swirling green liquid within sprayed the night like an exploding geyser. He first felt the warm sensation of heat on his now bare face. Then, a hissing rung within the knight's ear, which quickly deafened into a low-pitched muffle as everything began to sound very distant. The taste of sour metal filled inside of his mouth. The knight's tongue tingled for only a moment before the feeling came to a numbing end. Shifting his head back towards the bulb, the knight found his vision could not follow suit, as his sight sluggishly made the attempt but trailed behind in delay. Only until mustering all his effort to refocus, his vision finally caught up, and he managed to see the bulb had indeed been destroyed. Once again, but this time without willful movement, the knight's vision fell towards the ground. The descent of his sight brought about a tugging sensation from deep within the knight's head. After a few moments, the sensation ended in a wet snap, and the knight saw only blackness. Enfeeblement encumbered him. His limbs became unresponsive, and he crashed onto the soft orchard ground. A gargling laugh bellowed madly. Not too fast now, human. The wild and roaring laughter barely allowed for any legible words to be heard. I want, enjoy, poison that's fermented for oh so long. The Fairweather Knight heard the distant words, but found himself unable to string together his thoughts to make any sense of them. The crazed voice continued to violently blabber. Oh, what joy you've given this day. A glorious image will watch you melt as I fade. The booming and rocky sounding voice trailed off into bumbling grumbles and then hacking coughs until finally silence overcame the rotting orchard.